let's turn to Acts chapter 8 and look at the situation in Samaria. This is phase two, really, or maybe phase three. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and on and on and on. And so far in chapters one to seven, it's been focused very narrowly on Jerusalem and the situation in Jerusalem. And it, but it says all Judea and there was a coming in. And at the end of that section, we see the towns outside Jerusalem coming to see what's going on. But then the persecution hits. And then Paul is sent out or Saul is sent out to bring things into order, a kind of a police state type of mentality. And then we pick up in chapter eight, verse four, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And you think about word scattered can mean disappeared, dissipated, like scattering the ashes of a dead man. Or scattered can mean scattered seed, that wherever it lands, it grows. And maybe some of the ambiguity of that term is, is in play here, that in, according to the powers that be, the intent of the persecution was to scatter them. In terms of the real power that is, it was to seed them. So they were preaching wherever they went. And Philip, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. That word proclaimed means he gospeled it. He evangelized or he just proclaimed. He talked about Jesus there, but he talked with authority. Do you remember that word about Jesus? Like he, he didn't speak like the teachers of the law. He spoke as one with authority. Like a policeman might say, stop in the name of the law. He's speaking with authority. It's not personal. He represents a power greater than himself. Stop in the name of the law. And things stopped. <laughs> things livened up. And because Philip spoke with authority. But think who, who Philip was. In chapter six, we're introduced to Philip as a somebody to 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 help serve the growing community of Jesus somebody to wait on the tables and make sure there's a fair and equitable division of food between the greek speakers and the hebrew speakers but now we see something different and it's important to notice that difference that just because you have one ministry at one season of your life doesn't mean that that's it forever. Thing, things change. And the Holy Spirit, as Paul said a little bit later in one of his letters, he's saying you know, the, the Spirit is working. It's like electricity coming into a house. And some of it is used for, for the TV and some of it is used for heating. Some of it's used for cooking. Well, what's necessary? What's necessary just now? And now the Holy Spirit is moving upon Philip. And so this guy who was just waiting on tables is now proclaiming the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And not only so, he's speaking, he's proclaiming, he's speaking with authority and the authority is being manifest in what happens next. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed. So now you have something else. They heard, they heard, and they saw they weren't just listening and making an intellectual appraisal of what he said they were seeing and they were seeing specifically they were seeing signs and they were miracles they were miracles it says many who were paralyzed or lame were healed it's exorcism impure spirits came out of many and so they're seeing something extraordinary they're seeing physical change in people they're seeing mental and emotional change in people at the name of jesus it's just staggering until you see it happen in front of you and then there's a consequence and we and 
Luke brings us a variety of the consequences of, of that proclamation. One is awe and amazement. They were amazed and perplexed. Everybody was astonished. Great fear was among the people in the church and throughout Jerusalem. Anybody who heard about this. So there's a variety of responses. And here there's one powerful response. So there was great joy in that city and remember of course what city that was this is samaria this is almost enemy territory almost going across beyond the pale this is outside now the samaritans were kind of like you might say cousins of of the the jews they weren't disassociated completely but there was so much racial tension and john makes the very side remark that of course the jews have no dealings with samaritans so they were considered other they were different they were outsiders and this is where the gospel's gone and luke just declares this and he has also declared the program of events in chapter one verse eight you'll be my witnesses that expanding concentric circles, like coming out from a bullseye of the resurrection, going wider and wider to the ends of the earth. So this is a, a massive bridge that is being crossed here. Um, Philip strides across that bridge, that cultural bridge, that racial bridge, that culture bridge, uh, the religious restrictions and everything, without barely mentioning it. Because they were, they had to go somewhere. They went there, and, and Philip went down there and proclaimed the Messiah there. So it's just like wherever you go, what holds you back? What holds you back? Well, I, I don't really want to share my understanding of the truth about life here because I'm in a foreign country, or they won't listen to me, or or you know, we can make so many restrictions upon ourselves based upon ourselves but what's happening in the first part of the book of acts is it is the life of jesus it is the power of the spirit it is the, it is the 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 testimony of god it is too important to keep to ourselves so there was great joy in the city and then we're introduced, as we so often are in the narrative of, of Luke, with the other side of it, you know, like we've been introduced previously in chapter four and five with, with how powerfully generous the community of Christ was, the way that they used their money and their goods so lovingly, so caringly. And then in chapter five, we have a picture of imposters who were using their money to gain celebrity with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. So here again, we have the same kind of to and fro side of it. We have, we have great joy in the city, the power of the spirit being evident and exorcisms and healings. And then comes the opposite perspective. Okay, now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed so that verb is now used of somebody who was i guess we can say in touch with a different kind of power and he boasted that he was someone great so you've got the celebrity angle and all the people both high and low gave him their attention and proclaimed this man is rightly called the great power of god it's rather reminiscent of Balaam, isn't it, in the Old Testament, you know, who said his inspiration came from God. And yet he was for hire. He, he was getting money to curse Israel. He got something of the same sort of flavor. And he was an established celebrity in the area. He had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So that but suggests 
there's a breaking point. They've stopped following one power and they've begun to follow another. So something interesting here. Simon himself believed and was baptized. So he not only gave it intellectual agreement, but baptized is almost like kind of code for, well, he was brought into membership. He was, you know, he was baptized. He was part of the fellowship now. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. And then we have the moment when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. They sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They'd simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So that's interesting, isn't it? So we have a very clear two-tier thing going on here a baptism in the water and a baptism in the Holy Spirit, a, an agreement or a, a coming into faith on one level and then another level. Then we have the picture of Peter and John being somehow part of a hierarchical uh, priority, you know, higher than Philip. This is how it appears, isn't it? This is the most obvious reading of it. And the point is to, to not just immediately say, yes, this is how it always is. Very much Luke is writing, this is how it was. This is how it was. And things are changing as they move forward. But in this instance, in this time, at this, at this uh, part of the story, Philip is obviously enjoying incredible success. Peter and John come out of Jerusalem they follow him and they pray for the new believers. And there's a specific difference. Maybe it's the difference between moving from black and white TV to color TV. There was something significant that changed. And Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They were catching up with Pentecost. Pentecost had happened, but it hadn't happened for them. This is what the text says, isn't it? And then, because the point of this story is the fake uh, account, the, the, you know, the fake, the, the, the opposing side of power. We've got the correct power. We've got the power from Jerusalem, P Peter and John. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit working through, through Philip. And now we have the other side of it. When Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. He said, give me also this ability that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. This is not a million miles from where we live today, where there are charlatans who speak of the Holy Spirit, who even demonstrate great and astonishing feats, but have a financial edge you might say so and it's amazing how often money becomes part of it you think of money being part of it with judas money being part of it with ananias and sapphira and here the word of money coming into simon's decision making peter's very explicit may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of god with money you've got no part in this sharing this ministry because your heart's not right before god repent pray to the lord in the hope that he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart for i see that you're full of bitterness and captive to sin then simon answered pray to the lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me maybe simon's heard of ananias and sapphira this is where the passage stops or this section of the passage stops the story of Samaria and Philip. And as quite often is the case, we, we're not told the consequence. There are many, many stories in later church history of this character, Simon Magus, but this is where the biblical account finishes. And you might say it finishes with a question. And the question is, what's the place of celebrity? 
in your Christian discipleship? What's the place of money in your Christian walk? And Peter says something really profound here. I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Why is he bitter? The only thing that you can draw from this passage is that Philip and Peter and John are exhibiting something that he doesn't have and he's jealous of it. He has been number one in the area and they have taken hold of his pitch. And he doesn't like it. And captive to sin means he is brooding about these things. So at the same time as being baptized, at the same time as being following Philip everywhere, <laughs> at the same time as being a believer, he is full of bitterness and captive to sin. It's, a, it's another one of, of Luke's ways of saying this is the story of the church and the church church's story is not an unmixed one. I'm not going to tell you the ideal picture. I'm going to tell you the real picture and I'm going to leave it as a question because it's a question that we have to answer for ourselves. So, Lord, we pray. We pray as we receive this. Lord, these words are written for, for a warning and a rebuke as well as for encouragement and, and for building us up. So help us to listen and learn and respond and so live for your glory and not our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today.